Um, this is from Tales of Iceland, uh, or Running with the Hood of Folk in the Permanent Daylight. And we have a cover now, so that's what that looks like. Um, yeah, alright. That's so, you running naked on the cover. me running naked on the cover, so purchase it back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I thought I'd read uh, tonight from a portion of the book that has absolutely nothing to do with Iceland. So we have to back up. Because in order to understand just how fried my brain was after the first 72 hours I spent in Iceland, I have to begin with this story, even though it has literally zero relevance to anything Iceland-related. This story is the nexus, the jumping-off point, for experiencing the kind of sleep deprivation usually associated with the first Afghans we caught after 9-11, but to stand on boxes for days straight while CIA dogs barked at me. My Iceland, my Iceland air flight was out of JFK, the least accessible airport in the contiguous U.S., which <laughs> stupidly just meant that eventually I had to find my way from Chicago to New York City. When buying flights overseas, I tend to envision everything east of the Mississippi as where I live, and therefore easy and cheap enough to reach one way or the other without worrying about it until the week before the trip. New York City, however, is also home to one of my oldest friends, Ian, with whom I find it constitutionally impossible to not get fucked up out of my mind when we are together. <laughs> We're extremely bad influences on each other. What happened was this. I had a flight from O'Hare to White Plains Airport in Westchester, New York, which was the most accessible airport for Ian to pick me up. My United flight left O'Hare around 4 p.m. and was supposed to get into White Plains at 7. This flight was one of those bad dreams, with the cliché of the screaming three-year-old whose lungs didn't tire the entire two hours until, 20 minutes away from landing, the pilots discovered that the flaps were not deploying. Now maybe you're a Boeing engineer and immediately understand what this means, but all the people on this United flight did not, and the way the flight attendant doled out this information could not have been scripted to accrete more tension. Now what this means, the flight attendant said, is that we can't slow down before we land. <laughs> the passenger, eyes wide and sharp, inhales. We can still land, but White Plains doesn't have a long enough runway. So we're all Fox passengers wondering we're going to die because White Plains skipped on its fucking runway length? <laughs> the closest runway that's long enough for this kind of landing is actually Chicago O'Hare Airport. <laughs> oh, so we'll live, but this is going to be really annoying. <laughs> and don't worry, we have enough fuel. Yeah, that didn't even occur to me, but now I'm retroactively worried about that. <laughs> the landing is going to be a little different than you're used to. We'll be coming in pretty fast and hard. We're going to die, aren't we, you fucking liar? <laughs> also, that's what she said. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, there will be fire trucks and ambulances there to greet us when we land, but they're just a precaution. Jesus Christ. As you can imagine, by the time we landed in Chicago, surrounded by fire trucks and ambulances, deplaned, replaned on a new plane, and flew back to White Plains, a certain loss syndrome had taken over, <laughs> in which you cannot help but bond with your immediate passenger mates who are also suffering through this shitty airline experience, to the point where you're all ready to go search for the s smoke monster. <laughs> Ian picked me up at midnight, greeting me with a half-hour rant that went approximately like this. Fucking Markley, who the fuck do you think you are? Mr. Hollywood, Mr. fucking Hollywood sells one movie script that thinks he can fly in on his private jet whenever he feels like it, and the whole world will just act as his chauffeur. Like, I don't have anything better to do but wait at the airport for five hours while you get your ass licked on George Clooney's yacht. <laughs> Some shit. All right, let's go get drunk. <laughs> the night proceeded as if it was going to be a bust. Ian and I drank tall boys out of brown paper bags on the A-train and hurled down to the West Village where we played pool, slammed three dollar paps, and generally tried to make something of our failing night. We decided to wander over to a favorite bar of mine called White Horse Tavern, only, only to discover it was closed. This was at about 3.30 a.m., and I saw that a small bar across the street called WBEX Radio, I'll never forget it, was still open, so we ducked in there, only to discover that there appeared to be, appeared to be no good-looking girls at all. There were two guys at the bar and a couple of small groups in the booths by the window, maybe 11 total, still drinking at that hour. We sat at the bar, ordered beers, and I bought Ian tequila to make up for my late flight. Only then did I notice that none other than Kiefer Sutherland, the Kiefer Sutherland of Flatliners, Lost Boys, and most notably Jack Bauer fame, was sitting in the corner booth with some friends. It wasn't even one of those things where you have to squint and wonder if you're seeing someone famous because he was that close and that distinctly Kiefer Sutherland looking. Holy shit, I said to Ian, that's not even close to not being Kiefer Sutherland. <laughs> <laughs> yep, said Ian, that's for sure Kiefer Sutherland. 
We had a pleasant, too sober discussion about how we were just not the kind of people who would ever approach a famous person to say hi, because there's something distinctly tacky and needy in doing that. Now maybe if it was someone I just fucking worship, like your basic Bruce Springsteen or civil rights legend Congressman John Lewis, my mom would kick into overdrive, and I wouldn't be able to help it. But we were not about to do anything except tell all our friends and family that we once saw Keeper Sutherland drinking in a bar at 3.30 a.m. I love 24, even after it became a total parody of itself, so I was pretty stoked even for this. Certainly I could at least turn it into a short blog post. <coughs> Keeper appeared to be with a small group of friends, maybe two guys and a woman, although this all became consumed in the fog of what happened next. The bartender called last call, and Kiefer, and Kiefer got up to order one last shot. Ian and I were finishing our beers, and as he approached the short end of this L-shaped bar, right there, it was, uh... <laughs> We were obviously going to watch him take the shot. There were two guys beside us, pretty evidently boyfriends on a date, maybe just having a nightcap before they went home. And the smaller, slender of the two, a kid who maybe came up to my collarbone if he stood on his tiptoes, suddenly got bold and said across us to Keeper Sutherland, you should buy shots for the whole bar. <laughs> he said this as Keeper was in the midst of, of taking his shot, maybe Jaeger, but uncertain. And he, he slugged it back the way he would in a movie and, and slapped the glass back down on the bar with two fingers. His eyes rose lazily upwards and came to rest on the kid. There was this really long beat during which he just stared at the kid and everyone in the bar stared at him. <laughs> then Keeper Sutherland goes, What the fuck did you just say to me? <laughs> I laughed because I thought he was joking. <laughs> and then I just shut my mouth. <laughs> You want me to buy fucking shots for the bar, you stupid fuck, he said, his voice rising. Who the fuck do you think you are? Maybe you want to go outside. Maybe you want to go outside and see what the fuck is up, huh? And he had this really vicious, grinding, hoarse edge to his voice. The kind he had when he was torturing Arabs to find out the location of nuclear footballs and such. His friend, the woman, came up and patted him on the shoulder and said, come on, come on, let's go. No, fuck this guy! Screamed Keeper. Fucking big man, hot shit, fucking piece of shit. Fuck you, asshole, you fucking loser. Fuck you! And Keeper Sutherland was like screaming at this kid who just sat there taking it. And maybe he tried to stammer an apology at first, but Keeper's rage was just so white hot, so disproportionate to the relatively innocuous comment the kid had just offhandedly let loose. Probably because he was attempting to think of an excuse to engage a celebrity in conversation without seeming like a drooling plebe asking for an autograph. You fucking piss ant, you fucking piece of shit, you want me to fucking buy you a shot? Let's step outside, man, let's see who's buying a fucking shot then, he roared. And then he bounded out of the bar, throwing the door wide so that it crashed against the side of the building, and he was gone. <laughs> Everybody in the bar was wide-eyed and looking around at each other, just like, what just happened? <laughs> Did Keeper Sutherland just freak out of, and then Keeper Sutherland comes crashing out of the bar. Understand, the barstool situation looked like this. Boyfriend, guy Keeper Sutherland is going to beat the fuck out of me, Ian. So Keeper kind of shoved in right between me and this, this tiny kid who would suggested Keeper buy shots for the bar, and he was just in full blown Jack Bauer, tell me where the detonator is mode. <laughs> in there because Keeper was raging, raging drunk, and smelled like a shipment of rye whiskey crashed into a moonshine distillery. <laughs> I mean, I was right by him. They were, they were gently tapping him on the shoulder, telling him, come on, it's, it was like not even a thing to them. Like, come on, man, it's not worth it. Come on, let's just go home. And it was comical because Keeper Sutherland is not a tall man, maybe five foot eight. And he was just screaming at this tiny gay guy who, let me make clear, I think Keeper had no idea was gay. In fact, in Keeper's drunken state, it appeared he was taking this kid wearing a 50s style v-neck for some kind of West Side Story tough. <laughs> <laughs> At least that was as plausible as anything that was happening. <laughs> and it was pretty hard to not find all this incredibly bewildering and amusing. I thought I was stifling a smile, but Ian later told me that I was just flat out cracking up at the bar, covering my mouth, and kind of watching Kiefer carry on without offering any help whatsoever. <laughs> but not laughing suddenly got way harder because then this star of film and television, 
stuffed a cigarette in his mouth, stepped back, and started flailing his arms in waves, and, I fucking kid you not, slipped into an Irish accent. <laughs> Hi! You think you're so fucking special, do you? You stupid fat. You stupid fucking piece of shit, I'll fucking take you outside and back out that world, boy! <laughs> and I was just thinking to myself, well, is, is Keeper Sutherland speaking in an Irish accent? Is this really happening? Does he have any kind of Irish ancestry, or is he making fun of this kid because he thinks the kid's Irish? <laughs> Yo, yo, you faggot, smiling, shining, fact, you went on arms undulating waves. I don't know why. I don't know why. <laughs> I'll see you outside, boy. And then his friends finally convinced Keeper to follow them outside, and he he went back to his normal American accent, shouting "fuck you" multiple times the rest of the way up, the rest of the way out of the bar. When he was gone, Ian and I just kind of exchanged this look like uh, that was the coolest thing I've ever seen, and thank God for the broken flaps of my airplane. <laughs> The two boyfriends hung back, and Ian and I slipped out of the bar to find Kiefer outside with his friend smoking a cigarette. I didn't really know what to say, but the situation seemed to warrant something. So I go, and I promise you I'm not making this up. Hey man, loved you in Melancholia. That movie was great. <laughs> and Kiefer Sutherland kind of looked at me with this huge jack-o'-lantern grin that just wrapped around his cigarette, and then he jerked his head once in a cocky, aggressive nod and said, Fuck yeah, you're fucking A right it was. <laughs> and that's the kind of book about Iceland this book about Iceland is. <laughs>